China's main goal is the domestic market. I think soft power has never really been China's strength, especially compared to other East Asian countries like Japan and Korea. In the U.S., it's really easy to change public space. It's really easy to organize. Um, so you can see like murals in a lot of places mm-hmm. in a lot of big cities are as a protest medium. That's a really big thing. But in China, obviously, things are very different. Mm-hmm. So that same relationship to public space doesn't really exist. Like you can't really change public space or organize in the same ways. There's like a joke that's like mm-hmm. wherever there is cheap rent, you'll find artists. And that was the case in a lot of big Chinese cities where artists would go into these usually like abandoned warehouse, and then they would set up shop there, set up studios there. The government would take notice, monetize it, or take it under control. And then the artists would be like, oh, rents, rent is rising, we're under like a certain like surveillance or a certain like, you know, mm-hmm. set of rules now. And then they would go to the next place with cheap rent. Texts, like big chunks of texts are considered like, you know, somewhat sensitive. And when you say like, oh, maybe censorship's the reason why you can't see so many galleries in Beijing. I would say that maybe there's not that sort of like correlative relationship because in Shanghai, there is like quite an established institution of like cultural policing at the same time that there is a robust art market. Art has a way of transcending boundaries. So whenever you are in a new country, you always want to explore the art scene because it tells you a lot about the history, the culture, and the contemporary times of that region. So on this segment of Understanding China Better, today I have a Schwarzman scholar and an art enthusiast, Anna Chen, and she's going to be talking about the art scene in China. Welcome to the show, Anna. Thank you for having me. Tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got passionate about it. How did you discover this like love for art? I grew up doing some form of art always. Like my first form was writing and then I spent a lot of my life doing classical ballet. So I was always really in the performing arts world, um, always very in like the literature or literary scenes. Um, and just last year, I just graduated college. So like the year before I graduated, I started working in San Francisco Chinatown, um, helping with the art scene there, um, exploring ways of community organizing through art. Um, and that's when I really started getting interested in the visual arts industry, which is something I had never explored before. So basically helping bring curators from different parts of the world to San Francisco to open an exhibit, throwing and then like stage managing for like an arts slash music slash performing arts mm-hmm. festival um, for people in Chinatown. And then basically just like opening my eyes to the ways that the visual arts industry can like transform a community and can bring people together. And so once I got to Beijing, I started getting really interested in the ways that the lessons I learned in San Francisco might be applied to communities here. So looking at how communities are formed through art, um, how artists move around different cities in China, um, how the visual arts industry has changed, and how those changes affect artists or are kind of like reflected in policy. There's a very interesting connection between like art and government and policy and polity here. I still consider myself quite like a newbie to mm-hmm. like visual arts, the industry and also the practice of it. Um, So I feel like I'm really studying it in more of an academic capacity. And yeah, I feel like I'm as much of a learner and as much of an enthusiast as I am like a scholar. You really go out in China and you explore the contemporary art scene here and you're like very actively trying to understand it. What did you discover when you were in America Mm -hmm. and then you were studying about art and culture and how it affects the diaspora Mm -hmm. versus when you came here in Beijing and you started seeing how art is being seen here or absorbed here in Shanghai or in Beijing? Basically, well, I'm Chinese American and the arts that I worked in in the U.S. were mainly like community organizing, so trying to bring people together through performing arts festivals or using arts to explore issues like gentrification. Um, So the arts I did in San Francisco felt very visceral and very grounded in community. Um, So I don't think I was really a part of like the arts industry. I was more a part of like community organizing circles and communities that are facing like various struggles and confront those struggles through art. Um, But then when I got to China, I realized that there's quite a different relationship between people and public space. So in the US, um, it's really easy to change public space. It's really easy to organize. Um, So you can see like murals in a lot of places, Mm -hmm. in a lot of big cities, Chicago, San Francisco, New York. Um, You also just see a lot of like different grassroots organizations mobilizing around art and art as a protest medium. That's a really big thing. Um, But in China, obviously things are very different. Mm -hmm. So that same relationship to public space doesn't really exist. Like you can't really change public space or organize in the same ways. A lot of the times I see contemporary art, or not even contemporary art, just like art communities who find a space. Um, 
usually with very cheap rent. There's like a joke that's like, wherever there is cheap rent, you'll find artists. And that was the case in a lot of big Chinese cities where artists would go into these usually like abandoned warehouse or like industrial mm -hmm. um, complexes. And then they would set up shop there, set up studios there, form little communities. And then the government will take notice, monetize it or take it under control. And then the artists would be like, oh, rent's, rent is rising. We're under like a certain like surveillance or a certain like, you know, Mm -hmm. set of rules now and then they would go to the next place with cheap rent and they would set up shop there and that has been repeated in several big cities I think Beijing is a very big one and so is Shanghai the main difference I noticed when I first came to Beijing which was like in September or October was that it's very very hard to organize in a public space and it's very hard to form a community in the same way that you would in the US do you think there's a lot of like government patronage of artists here and does that also shape the art that when you know that there are some strings tied to maybe the government sponsoring your rent or like taking care of the artist community then there's certain spaces which you need to avoid when you are creating art and it really impacts like creative freedom that they can otherwise exercise in different domains yeah um well i think in both the us and in china there's quite a lot of like rules about like what art can be displayed where in terms of government regulations like yes in china there's a very interesting dynamic where um the government will allow certain like artworks or like literature or film to be displayed outside China because mm -hmm. they know it's it can be quite lucrative in international markets but domestically um, these same pieces are not allowed to be dis displayed or are displayed in like very censored or like cut versions um, you can see this in films like you know Zhang Yimou's films or like fifth generation filmmakers whose films are like very successful outside China mm -hmm. or like in Hong Kong or in like other like areas in like the Sinosphere. But um, when it comes to domestic audiences, those same things are not allowed to be displayed. Um, lots of authors will s sometimes write like multiple versions of the same thing, um, the same piece to be displayed or read outside versus inside China. Mm -hmm. And same with artists, like, you know, sometimes artists, like their artwork is not allowed to be displayed. So like the cultural police will come in and we'll look at an art piece and be like, oh wait, turn this around, you're not allowed to display this right now. Um, but we'll encourage that work to be sold internationally. Um, and another mm -hmm. quite interesting thing is like text has a lot of sensitive, it, text is a very sensitive thing. Um, a lot of curators I've talked to say that they're not allowed to display like big chunks of text in their galleries. So sometimes you'll see art and no text next to it. It doesn't matter what kind of product it is, what kind of painting it is, like just text itself. Text, like big chunks of text are considered like, you know, somewhat sensitive. So a lot of galleries, and like, I don't have an exact number, but like quite a lot of galleries will have just like paintings with no text next to it or like no explanation, which makes the visual arts industry a bit more inaccessible, mm. I think. Um, and sometimes like curators will keep their archives or keep their like publications hidden or separate, like away from the public eye so as to not like raise these like suspicions or like alarm. Which kind of products do you think have like an incredible market domestically? Mm -hmm. Like whether it is in terms of paintings or like handicrafts or different kinds of art products um, or text or visual media versus like which kind of products do you see getting more attention in the international market? Well, first of all, I think um, China's main goal is the domestic market because there's such a huge population in mm -hmm. China. I think soft power has never really been China's strength, especially compared to other East Asian countries like Japan and Korea. Um, so China's trying very, very hard to develop a domestic cultural industry and trying to merge that with a tourism industry. So like a domestic tourism industry. Um, so in 2018, you might know about the Department of Culture and Tourism, so the Wen Lu Bu, and they were formed that year to basically like merge um, the cultural industry with the domestic tourism industry. And I think they've been quite successful. Um, you know, in terms of like what domestic tourists like consuming, I feel like there's quite a lot of like old cities or towns that were built up to be just like cultural monuments or like spaces. Um, and a lot of tourists like to go to these places. Um, my main study, like field of study is like the art district, um, which is interesting because I think I went into the art districts thinking, like, you know, a lot of Chinese people go here, mm -hmm. if not to look at the art, then to take pictures or to just, like, be in a space, right? But um, most of the customers in the art district, especially in the galleries, are international. Mm -hmm. So, you know, places like 798 or M50, um, these art districts 
they're kind of known as like tourist hotspots and a lot of artists or like curators remove their spaces to art districts because first of all they're subsidized by the government like rent is subsidized and second of all they know it it attracts international business um so it really depends on like like what kind of audience you're looking at i also think a cultural industry is different from the art market so like cultural industry is like things that are sold for a general public um Mm -hmm. To keep the masses like consuming products, you know, um, whereas an art market is tailored more towards a very select, a very affluent, and usually older generation of collectors. Um, so a lot of galleries I speak to say they cater exclusively to the same people that they've catered to for decades. So people from the 80s or the 90s who are very consistent with collecting art, um, and they say they're not really interested in attracting either domestic or international tourists because they don't have the purchasing power for these things, right? Like they wouldn't buy artwork off a wall. I think there's quite a lot of markets that constitute the cultural industry. Um, and I also think that like, in terms of what products are most successful, it really depends on like what audience you're looking at. If you talk about the diaspora, do you think when you're tapping into the art market and the, when the artists are thinking about it, then Chinese diaspora community is like a target audience for all these products, a target customer for all these different products? I think the Chinese diaspora is not a target for China's cultural exports. The art scene in the US is very interesting, specifically like the Chinese American art scene. Um, there is a wave of galleries that have opened in like New York and on the on the East Coast. Um, just like young Asian American, Chinese American, or like people from Hong Kong or Taiwan opening their own galleries to basically support other Chinese American artists in the area, um, or to basically like just have a space in the U.S. That's for art. So I know there's that movement in the East Coast. Um, I think on the West Coast, in terms of like California, Seattle, um, other hubs for the Chinese diaspora, a lot of it has to do with like social movements and community organizing. Because like California is that hotbed mm-hmm. for like activism. Like the term Asian American was born out of Berkeley in California, um, and I think there's like there's quite a lot of political movements that are intertwined with art, um, and even like the big art organizations that. I'm aware of or have worked with, like the Chinese Culture Center in San Francisco, um, a lot of their programs have social justice initiatives behind them. And a lot of their programs are meant to cater towards Chinatown's residents or to, you know, raise the voices of like marginalized Chinese American or like, you know, other, like other marginalized voices. That's what art is for in those communities. So yeah, I think art looks quite different across diaspora. Um, I also think like the way that the mainland relates to diaspora is very different according to where you are. Because I think like in the East Coast versus the West Coast, there are quite different like relationships. During your experience here in Beijing or in Shanghai or in different provinces of China ever since you've come here, have you explored like the art created by ethnic communities as well? Mm -hmm. And I ask this question because I was recently at the Shanghai Museum and there's like a specific area for handicrafts and different kinds of carvings created by ethnic communities in China. It was like incredible to look at. So have you like noticed whether across China in base in galleries or in other spaces, there is that space for the ethnic communities for creative expression as well, or that's been kind of missing? Creative expression is interesting. Um, I think ethnic minorities as like a tourist attraction or a label is very profitable for the government. So you think you see things created like the folk culture villages, like in Shenzhen in the 1990s, um, there was a folk culture village created, which basically featured every single ethnic minority in China. Um, and there's quite a lot of scholarship on this and it's various problems. Like for instance, people are recruited from these like different places in China and made to act like caricatures of themselves, um, basically not dressing in a way that honors their heritage or in a way mm-hmm. that's accurate to their heritage, but instead dressing in a way that would attract the most tourists. Um, you see just like different villages being built up in these like areas that are predominantly ethnic minority. And then like while these villages are very profitable, again, for like tourists trying to come in and like trying to see what China is really like, it often can push out um, the, the original ethnic minorities that are there. And I think there's quite a harmful like duality between like trying to profit off the aesthetic and the like experience of a folk culture or like an ethnic minority while also treating them worse than the Han majority or basically 
extracting the parts of culture that they want and that are most profitable to the culture industry um, without giving due respect to the actual people. I think there is that part of the culture industry that's very exploitative and um, quite harmful. I think also there are ways to honor and uplift um, people of ethnic minorities um, that different local governments are trying to undertake. Um, I think in Shenzhen there's been quite a push to elevate like Hakka minority voices mm -hmm. recently. Um, in like the Dafin oil like painting village, there's like a Hakka um, exhibit on display there. Um, I think like as someone who's not an ethnic minority, I can't really speak about um, this from like a matter from like mm, like a standpoint of expertise, yeah. right? But I can say that like the approaches differ according to different governments, but at the same time, because like the Han majority is so overwhelming. I don't think there is the same awareness of like what it means to like take a culture and to like sell it in that way. If you think about the ancient civilization and how art was in the time of like the Song Dynasty or the Han Dynasty or the Ming Dynasty, so there's a lot of like uh, differences that you see in the art forms in China that came during that time. There are a lot of paintings in like ancient Chinese civilizations in which th there is no like perspective of light so you cannot tell like whether a painting is during daytime or nighttime or any time mm -hmm. and the uses of like dots and lines and different like such nuances that existed during the ancient times if you talk about the contemporary art scenes are there like mm -hmm. certain characteristics that you witness which are maybe derivative of that ancient chinese culture or there are like some things new that are being experimented with for sure there's a lot of there's a lot of inspiration taken from ancient Chinese forms. Um, I'm not really someone who does like visual arts as a practice, so I can't speak from like an artist perspective, but I can say that, you know, there's an emphasis on like negative space um, mm -hmm. in Chinese traditional art that is not the same in like, like Western lineages of art, right? And I think that can be reflected in a lot of like contemporary art practices. I think also there's quite a lot of contemporary calligraphy, like calligraphy masters who draw inspiration from, but also subvert old art forms, um, like old ways of doing like mm -hmm. calligraphy. I think also exploring old Chinese motifs in contemporary lights, that's very interesting to me. I know a lot of, a lot of artists in Shanghai are right now exploring, you know, like bamboo, for instance, or like a panda or like a peony, these things that are very like characteristic of like ancient Chinese art forms and of ancient Chinese societies, um, like exploring what that really means and like subverting it and um, trying to find new meaning in these different like forms of nature. Like any society really draws from its past when creating a contemporary art scene. But at the same time, like a lot of artists that we see in China were also trained or at least exposed to a lot of Western art forms. Mm -hmm. And this is especially true in like contemporary art. So I wouldn't really say like, oh, we can draw a very clear lineage from this point of ancient Chinese art to this point of like contemporary Chinese art. I feel like it's more of, like a lot of different things have amalgamated to make this thing called Chinese contemporary art. Like yes, there's obviously gonna be stuff from like old China, ancient China, but there's also gonna be stuff from like lots of other weird and like cool influences too. And when you were in Shanghai, because when I visited, I could find like multiple art exhibitions and there are different galleries and different spaces you can go to mm -hmm. as compared to like Beijing, where there are still those spaces, but it's very limited. Do you see like province to province, there are these differences if there is exposure to like more international spaces or if there's like more patronage uh, given to artists, then the art scene is like completely different than say in places in which it's not that encouraged. Hmm. I mean... I think it really depends on city planning. Um, for instance, like Shanghai city planning was a lot more regulated and a lot more organized than Beijing's, which means that like big museums, like the ones you see in like the Pudong area, like those are planned with a lot more intention. And I think if I'm not if I'm not incorrect, like by the same like architectural firms that also plan much of the rest of the community. Whereas in Beijing, it's a bunch of different like. Mm -hmm. organizations working for different things like 798 the art district in Beijing that's like very very famous that land is owned by the seven stars company so not um, a government entity and in fact like there's a bit of tension between like different models of ownership um, so I feel like I feel like city planning is a big one I think even more so than um, like government regulations of art or like censorship um, I think it is urban planning and like navigating around old architecture too is a big part. I think if a city has really old architecture, then it will try to maximize 
its like cultural significance mm -hmm. and make it into a cultural industry. Um, whereas cities that don't really have that history or that historical weight will try to create a new site. Um, so yeah, I think city planning is a big part of that. I think also um, it's interesting because in Shanghai, that's where like the Wen Lubu, the cultural police are most well established because the Shanghai art market is great. It's like kind of Shanghai's, um, it's China's access point to the rest of the world, right? So there's a lot of like art trading, a lot of exhibitions, a lot of openings, a lot of exciting mm -hmm. things that are happening in Shanghai. Um, and when you say like, oh, maybe censorship's the reason why you can't see so many galleries in Beijing, I would say that maybe there's not that sort of like correlative relationship because in Shanghai there is like quite an established institution of like cultural policing at the same time that there is a robust art market. It just means that the two have to like navigate around each other. Whereas in Beijing, um, yes, yes, it is like a political capital, but at the same time, like those same policies, that same rhythm of policing is not quite present in Beijing in the same way. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, city planning, rent, um, like, the concept of an art market in the first place. Um, a lot of artists in Beijing, they'll form a community in Beijing, but a lot of them also sell their art in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. Whereas you won't see artists in Shanghai go back to Beijing to really sell their art, you know? Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot more factors than just government, like censorship on the cultural side. You're also like researching about the cultural industry, so I would love to understand whether you see that there is a lot of focus on research on art as well in China. Yeah, I think so. I think there's, I think contemporary art is an interesting field to research into because you're you'll inevitably end up straying into things like, you know, supply and demand, cultural industries, like fancy economic stuff, um, because so much of art practice I think is tied into the art industry, um, at least in the field that like I'm working in. I do think there's quite a robust like art scholarship in terms of like with visual arts practices in China. Um, there's been a lot of complaints about, you know, Kafa, the Central Academy for Fine Arts, or even like Tsinghua's own art school, not really allowing students to breathe and develop their own artistic style. And I can't speak to that because I'm not like part of those schools. Um, but those complaints are out there. Um, in terms of like scholarship about art, yes, there's like, a lot of like PhD students, grad students in Tsinghua studying art um, in any era, in all eras. Um, Tsinghua Art Museum was developed in collaboration with other art schools um, and it's a huge collection. It has like embroidery, pottery, um, calligraphy, calligraphy seals on display like permanently and it also has um, a contemporary art exhibit that just like opened that pulls an artist from like a bunch of different places. And like always, like if you go to an exhibit, you'll always see like academic coordinator or like academic consultant mm -hmm. on the, um, like the gallery credits because like that scholarship is very important to studying or understanding um, any art movement. So yeah, I think there's quite a robust scholarship. I think um, it definitely looks different and definitely has a lot of like different complaints depending on where you are in China. Um, but like I haven't like found myself running out of people to talk to and I feel like I've learned a lot from a bunch of different people. One thing everybody tells me about China is that it sees like massive transformations every decade or two. So the things that exist today might not have existed 10 years back like the coffee mm -hmm. culture here. Mm -hmm. So do you think the current, the vibrant art community that exists in China right now in your conversations with other artists or other people who are associated with this scene, have you discovered that was this always the case or like is this a recent phenomenon? Um, I can tell you just came from China Shanghai, because Shanghai has like 800 coffee shops. So uh, like coffee culture is huge there. But I think in terms of what, whether this art ecosystem existed a few years or decades back, no. Um, I can speak about art districts, because I think they're very interesting phenomena where like, as I mentioned, artists would gather in a place with really cheap rent, often like an abandoned warehouse or other spaces that are like very big and like spacious. But nowadays, if you look at 798, it's not really that same grassroots like entity right it's it was, it's very of, formalized yeah it's very formalized lots of galleries um you know in the early 2000s i think the number of galleries in 798 went up from like around 20 or 30 to over 300 which is like a huge rate and like galleries are not the same things as like publicly funded museums and they're not the same things as art studios mm -hmm. um and i think a big part of that was you know 
like the government trying very hard to make 798 into like a cultural icon for international and domestic audiences. But I think this also means that, you know, the market changes and the consumer base changes where galleries are kind of exclusive. Like they're communicated through word of mouth. Um, they cater to like, again, like really affluent audiences who can buy the art. Um, and I think 798 has like developed those galleries with a speed that's quite unmatched in other places in the world, um, which also means that, like, the audience that, like, can go to 798 and can access the art there has changed very fast, too. Um, and, like, artists' communities have moved to, like, Renminren, like, very close to Tsinghua campus, and then to Songzhuang, to just, like, different places around Beijing um, that have very cheap rents. So I think you can definitely see the same ecosystem of, like, you know, the cliched like poor struggling artists like mm. they'll always be like artists trying to make it or like artists with their studios in different places in China and, and different places in the world like art will always be there um, but as for whether and how these districts or these communities get formalized and get folded into a cultural industry I think we might see that same model repeated in China I can also like not really speak to how like this like this gallery model will work in the future because right now galleries across China are really struggling especially like galleries that opened in the last few years mm. a lot of them are struggling to keep their doors open so I don't know it's a waiting game yeah. we'll see <laughs> but when do you think this like entire initiative of formalizing these communities started mm. and what do you think might have triggered it yeah I think really in the early 2000s slash late 1990s a big part of it was like if a group of artists exists then any government will kind of catch on to it because first of all like there's a lot of money to be made in formalizing an art district um introducing like foreign culture entities into it like making it into a tourist attraction um like just stimulating economies in general so you see that in like los angeles new york like mm -hmm. chicago london anywhere in the world like china too beijing shanghai a big part of it too is also artists can often encourage social unrest so you see that in beijing where the government moved in and initially they were going Seven Star Company, which owns 798, wanted to turn um, 798, the art district, into like a tech zone. But like the government was like, wait, no, we can actually capitalize off this. We can control the art that's being displayed and we can turn it into this tourist attraction. And a big part of it, too, was like at that point, Beijing was very aware that, you know, the Beijing Olympics were going to happen. And an international audience was going to come to China and be really aware of China. So I think a big, a big part of like formalizing 798 was an attempt to um, basically market Beijing's new identity as like very contemporary, um, this force of contemporary art, you know, there are all these artists working here, super grungy and grassroots. Um, in 2007, so like a year before the Olympics, like there was a huge push in like tour books and TV programs to put 798 at the forefront of like tourist lists and like things to do when you like come mm -hmm. to Beijing um, and that was really, really successful so I think like money was a big part of it pushing a new identity was a big part of it um, especially if that like if your audience is the west I think China really wanted to be like oh we have this like cool new contemporary culture yeah I and think those were the key drivers finally what would you suggest somebody who visits China for the first time trying to explore the art scene what are the things to keep in mind where to start and how would you be able to develop like a comprehensive understanding of what art is all about in China because I've lived in China before this year too um, and I think each time I've been in China my understanding of art has been very different and then like my approach to art has been very different too um, and I think it really depends on what city you're in because like you can't go into China being like, I'm going to study art without also looking at like the vast history of Chinese mm. art. Um, so I would say really starting with like... Studying art history. Yeah, I'm not... Even like I'm thinking like, should that be a starting point? Because I feel like trying to go chronologically also has its own set of like issues and like... Yeah, I would say like really getting to know artists in China. I, I'm like, I'm always a big advocate for like person to person connections. Um, and you can see, you know, like artists at work in 798, you can see artists at work in smaller communities like Songzhuang, um, Suzhou, Hangzhou, and all of these artists, they do different like things and crafts, you know, like they work in different mediums. Um, and some of those mediums can be like much older like calligraphy or ink brush painting some of them can be contemporary artists um 
But I also just feel like it's very hard to get into the art world anywhere. Like, it's very easy to be a spectator, I think. Mm-hmm. But in terms of wanting to like participate in the art world, I think it really depends on like people and like getting to know people. Just like have a very open mind towards like what you may see. Um, understand that art is kind of like everywhere. Like even if you're not paying lots to get into like a gallery or a museum, there's still like, you know, the art of like that can be found in like a hu tong, like small calligraphy shops that are just in like certain older districts in Beijing. Um, you know, like oil painting villages in the south of China. It's kind of like everywhere. I think just like letting yourself wander, letting yourself see it, and just having a very open mind is how I would approach it. Thank you so much for joining us, Anna, Thank and so giving us this like brief understanding of Chinese art. I hope everybody who's watching this show finally has a better understanding, at least, of Chinese art and culture. And that is the entire purpose of this show. We're trying to understand China better.